So the first problem is something we have used in the uh, past homework and now you have to derive it. it. You won't be able to do it given material that was done till Monday. To, today's class is important for that. The second problem is Carnot cycle, which you have seen in a PV diagram. So you can take as a given all that you have done in the PV diagram. And from that, you can go and derive how it looks in an entropy temperature, volume temperature, and pressure temperature diagram. The third one, again, uses material from today. You have to show enthalpy, partial derivative with respect to pressure is related to the thermal expansion coefficient. And you use this expression in part B to calculate <clears throat> the change in molar enthalpy for liquid benzene. Problem four will be straight off today's class. It's good practice to do this and really drive it in, uh, inside our heads. Problem five is a long problem. It's a very practical problem related to something that, well, we are, we are, this reaction is going on right now as we are talking to each other, you know, all the time, ATP four minus two, ATP three minus, and uh, the whole thing. Kinases in the body help in this reaction. So here you will be using your peak end knowledge to figure out what's really going on in the hydrolysis of ATP. Problem six is a bit uh, different. It needs a lot of constants. And instead of giving you the values of the constants, I would like you to figure out what are the constants you need. And it's all open book, open internet. Look up the internet to find the values of the constants and just cite uh, your source. You know, say, uh, you can use a subscript and write down at the end of your answer number one from this website and just write it down. Or Atkins has these values also referred there. So if you use from Atkins, specify if you are using it from a table or if any exercise in the Atkins had provided these values. So I need to think about uh, what how do you get these numbers? And uh, you so you will find that at five degrees Celsius, liquid water changed to ice is not spontaneous. And uh, I've, it's not asked to be done in this problem, but what you can do is to go and try doing this at zero degrees Celsius or minus five degrees Celsius, and you will see that it is actually spontaneous. So it's, it's not a hard homework, but it will hopefully uh, give you a sense of, give you more appreciation for the things we have been doing. Any questions? Okay, so let's go to our today's material. So <clears throat> what we did last time was to introduce two new state functions. Why did we introduce two new state functions? Because we are interested in figuring out conditions for spontaneous change. The most important example of spontaneous change is, you know, well, the universe is evolving, time is moving forward. You know, why, why is that spontaneous? Because it, the entropy of the universe as a whole is increasing. So the condition for spontaneous change is delta S total more than zero. Reversibility, is delta S total is equal to zero. And uh, what happens when delta S total less than zero? Then reverse is, or not reverse is a com confusing word here, uh, opposite direction is one of spontaneous change. Equivalently, so this was our second law. Equivalently, we had Clausius statement which said that DS system and normally, I will, you will find that I often don't write whether it's DS system or DS total. It's a good idea to write it. I should be writing it. I'll try to write as much as I can, but otherwise you can interrupt me and ask. And if in any problem, it's not clear what it is, please ask me. Normally, it should be clear from the context. Clausius inequality said that condition of spontaneous change is 
there is no equal if you put equal then that's reversible and this here is d ds system and dq uh, or uh, to be uh, rigorous delta q is the heat given to the system so this is the condition for spontaneous exchange so at this point we introduced two state functions one of them was helmholtz free energy defined as a is equal to u minus ds and gibbs free energy defined as g is equal to h minus ts in both of them we have subtracted out es from u and from h respectively <clears throat> so why did we do this Sorry. the reason we did this is because the condition for spontaneous change can equivalently be written as the a at constant temperature and volume less than or equal to zero and dg at constant temperature and pressure less than or equal to zero so notice that these two things had more than t zero or more than dq by t but in this one you have less than uh, we are talking about spontaneous so we should remove this so spontaneous change is the if you are looking at a reaction happening at a constant temperature and volume then the direction for spontaneous change is one in which the helmholtz free energy goes down if you are looking at a reaction at constant temperature and pressure then the direction of spontaneous change is the one in which the gibbs free energy goes down and uh, then we so I'm, I'm just recapping the material from last time because it was it was a fair amount of new ideas that we introduced and then we introduced some intuition for what a and g are we showed last time that change in a if during a process you calculate the change in the helmholtz free energy a that is the maximum work obtainable from a system at constant t and i again want to drive home that there is no constant volume that showed up in this physical interpretation and why did this happen you can go through the proof again from last time the constant volume does not show up here it's just constant t and what we started showing last time but did not finish and we will do it in detail today we will show today similar thing for g that change in g is maximum non expansion work so if you really want to calculate the work that you can get out of the system which is not just of an expansion nature but the, the all the other type of work non expansion work obtainable from a system at constant p and p so in this one t and p both show up in helmholtz free energy only t shows up so <clears throat> so let's let's work on this and uh, and before we go ahead i just want to restate it one final time that the condition for chemical equilibrium is da tv is equal to 0 dg tp is equal to 0 if the reaction is happening under constant t and v if the reaction is happening under constant t and p and this is what will later lead us to the concepts of equilibrium constant and things like that this is the condition for chemical equilibrium if this holds true so on this page all we have done is to restate this one this sec statement of second law of thermodynamics in different ways there is no new information here it's the same thing just expressed in ways that are more useful for us there is absolutely no new information which is kind of what thermo is we have first law and second law and everything else is to and third law if you really care for the value of entropy at 0 kelvin and to re-express it in different forms but the key idea is first law and second law so let's try to prove this one 
that change in G is maximum non-expansion work. And what do we mean by maximum? Maximum means that if the system is being driven reversibly, there is no dissipation to a cold sink. There is no sort of wastage of anything. If the system is being driven reversibly, then you can get the maximum work out of the system. And that is what we are talking about here. So we showed it for A, now we will show it for G. We started doing it. The algebra was a bit too much for 9.50 a.m. at the end of the class, so I stopped. So let's work through it. So G is equal to H minus TS, right? So therefore DG is equal to DH minus TDS minus SDT is equal to DH minus TDS at constant T. Right? We are talking about constant T and P. We haven't yet used constant P, but at constant T, this is going to be true. Now, H itself is internal energy plus pressure times volume. Therefore, DH is equal to DU plus DPV. So let's call this as equation one. Let's call this as equation two. Use two in one. So dg is equal to dh, which is given over here, du plus d of pv minus tds. Now what is du? Du itself is delta q plus delta w plus d of pv minus tds. Okay, now we have to realize that, well, g is a state function. So in order to calculate dg, we don't need to worry about delta Q and delta W and what was the exact path taken in order to do that. This is a state function. This is a state function. These two are not state functions, but we know. So let me write it with red. So this is not a state function. While these two are state functions. Well, this is not a state function, but we know that G itself is a state function. So our life is a bit simplified and we can calculate this DG by looking at a reversible process because it's a state function. So why not look at a reversible process? It doesn't matter whether we look at reversible or irreversible. So since, therefore, let's consider delta Q reversible and delta W reversible in order to calculate equation three. So then what will we have? Therefore dg is equal to delta q reversible. Now what is delta q reversible? Delta q reversible, let's write down the full thing. Delta q reversible plus delta w reversible plus t of pv minus tds. What is delta q reversible? That is tds, right? There is no inequality here. Delta q reversible is tds plus delta W reversible, plus D of PV minus TDS. TDS, TDS cancels out. We are left with delta W reversible plus D of PV. Delta W reversible is minus PDV plus, oh, sorry, it's uh, actually, let's split it out. Delta W reversible is delta W reversible expansion plus delta W reversible additional. Delta W expansion plus delta W reversible additional plus T of PV. What is delta W reversible expansion? That is minus PDV plus delta W reversible. I'm just going to write ADD for the additional and D of PV is PDV plus VDP is equal to delta W reversible additional plus VDP. Now we introduce the constant pressure condition. Remember, this is where in Helmholtz energy, we were done. We didn't have to introduce any constant volume. We were happy with constant pressure. Here we have to. At constant pressure, DP is equal to zero. Therefore, DG is equal to delta W reversible additional. And this is what we had set out to show that the change in Gibbs free energy is the maximum non-expansion work that you can get out of a system. Any questions about this?
So yeah, I have a quick go question. Uh, what is the additional work? So good, good part. So I, I should give you an example. So the additional work is, for example, pushing electrons through a circuit. You are doing some work, right? When you are pushing electrons through some electric circuit. Is that expansion work? Not really. The circuits is not expansion, expanding or pushing a liquid through a column. Pushing, I'm writing column through a liquid, pushing a liquid through some column. So, so far in thermo, we have always thought of work done as expansion work, right? But we know that work done, that's not the only example of work done. There can be many other forms of work done, for example, by driving electrons against a resistance or something else. Yeah, so that's, does that help? I assume it does, okay. So, and yeah, there is a question, where does the TDS come from? So that we here, so let's go through it again. We had in equation three, dg is equal to delta q plus delta w. So equation three was this one, right? And in this one, we were faced with delta q and delta w, which we don't know how to deal with. But then we realized that dg is a state function. So why not just talk about reversible things? Because it will be simple. So we change this delta q to delta q reversible and delta w reversible. And at this point, we realized that delta q reversible is equal to TDS. Well, that's the definition of DS, right? That was our definition of entropy, that DS is equal to delta Q reversible by T. That's how we defined entropy. So you shouldn't be forgetting that. Or I'll be very sad. Okay, so, and uh, now we are ready to basically move on to the next thing, but I want to highlight that there is a problem in Atkins, which I had mentioned last time. It's a solved problem that you should all go through. It will hopefully give you some uh, intuition for all of this. It looks at oxida uh, oxidation of glucose. It's Atkins 3.D.1 and it starts with one mole of glucose, blah, blah, blah. Please go through it. If anything about it is not clear to you, post it on the Slack channel and I'll talk about it. Could you do it if it was not DQ reversible? You couldn't do anything, Elizabeth. You would just get stuck. But that's where DG happens to be a state function, so we can do it. If DQ reversible, so you could do it, and it just so happens that even if delta Q was irreversible and delta W was irreversible, their sum has to be equal to what we wrote over here. So you could still do it, but the proof won't work. Here, we, like Thomas has said, we were able to choose a reversible path because it is a state function. So it came and helped us. We could still do it, it won't be general, and we would get stuck, it would depend on part. So you could do it for anything, but reversible is simplest, where we can rule, use the definition of and change the entropy. So this, so if you think about thermodynamics, many of you have done thermodynamics in high school, many of you have done thermodynamics in your freshman chemistry, you have looked at first law thermodynamics. The reason why 481 is a step further is primarily because of the state function, path function business. It becomes a bit complicated. If you go to the next level of thermodynamics, thermodynamics is a subject where the same ideas can be taught at different levels of abstraction. The next level of thermodynamics is Chem 684, which is the graduate thermodynamics, where it's all about something called Legendre transforms. That's the key over there. There, the starting point is that entropy is a function of number, volume, and energy, and the life begins from there. The same thing, but a different level of abstraction. But we are not in Chem 684, we are in Chem 481, so let's stay here. Okay, so we have done first law of second thermodynamics, we have done second law of thermodynamics. What I'm going to show you next is an integrated first and second law of thermodynamics. One equation that captures both the things. It has all the information that you need coming from first law and coming from second law. And uh, this will also help you see where's Kevin? Is Kevin around? Kevin who? Yeah, it's frozen, but I didn't write much. So one moment. 
Yeah, hello. Kevin's there. Good. So if you all remember Kevin's problem, that was first part of the problem that I asked you to prove. And then we realized that we, I think it was Matt Laskowski and others who pointed out you can't really do it without using entropy or Maxwell relations. Then I went back and checked a lot on it. I even asked other professors in the department and turns out they had all faced that problem at some point when they were my age, 30 years ago. And they said, yes, you cannot do it without using entropy. And we will see why that is the case. So how do we integrate first and second law of thermodynamics? So, well, first of all, first law of thermodynamics says du is equal to delta q plus delta w, right? So given some initial i and final f states, it's the same idea that we saw in the last thing over here that Elizabeth asked about, Elizabeth Engel asked about regarding DG. What, could, what, what we did here is to use a reversible path to calculate DG, right? The same thing applies over here. Given some initial state I and some final state F, DU is independent of the path you take. It really does not depend whether it's a reversible path, whether it's an irreversible path, what type of reversible path it is, it just doesn't matter. So we can always write down du as delta q reversible minus pdv. Here I am again back to uh, assuming only expansion work. Most of the times in this class, we will be assuming expansion work, but if you are interested in calculating anything about non-expansion work, you know, uh, Tim or Oluwadra, if I, if I pronounced your name right, if I did not, please forgive me, is working on solar cells and he's leading the UMD team on that. He will be interested in driving uh, uh, photons and electrons. So he will be interested in the work that is not expansion work. So his best friend- Very interested. Yeah, <laughs> his best friend will probably be looking at you too. He's not just interested in expansion work, right? So, but most of the time we will be talking about expansion work, but you have the tools to deal with non-expansion work also. So this, this class gives you tools, you know, that's, that's the idea here. So, so the point here is that du will always be equal to delta q reversible minus pdv, even if the path in a PV diagram from i to f was this path or this path, or it was some chunky path like this, it doesn't matter. Whatever path you have taken, du will be dq reversible minus pdb. If there is non-expansion work, then you have to think about that also, but for now we have ignored it. Then immediately we can use our definition of entropy and we can write it as delta q reversible minus pdv. This is what we did in our proof for d uh, Gibbs free energy physical significance. Therefore, du is equal to TDS minus PDV is always true. This is absolutely always true for any gas, any path, reversible or irreversible. And in this one equation, we have tied together the first law and second law of thermodynamics. This equation is super important. So the three equations that are most important so far that we have done are du is equal to delta Q plus delta W, the first law of thermodynamics. We introduced ds is equal to delta Q reversible by temperature, which is equivalent to the second law of thermodynamics. And now I just showed you that these two together, writing these two separately is the same as writing down du is equal to TDS minus PDV. So anytime in thermo you get lost, go back to these equations. These are your guiding, guiding. these are your north stars. These equations will guide you. You can start from here and everything happens. Now this is very interesting. Now uh, someone came to my office hour I think Sasha Coates asked me in the office hour, is the math going to peak up or is it going to go down or is it going to stay there? So this lecture and maybe the next one, the math's going to peak up and then it will go down and kind of stay there. But this is the maximum math business. 
this, this today's class. So here we have expressed u as a total differential, right? And in order to express u as a total differential in a way that accounts for both first law and second law, we have to use entropy and volume as its variables. This, this, is, this is, I think, the most, my number one beautiful concept in 481 that I'd like, I don't think I like anything as much as I like this one. So if you write u as a function of s comma v, you have integrated both first and second law. Remember when we just did the first law of thermodynamics, we had written u as a function of temperature and volume. Remember that? That's where we had du is equal to cv dt plus pi t dv. There is nothing wrong with that equation. That is fine. That's absolutely correct. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But that equation includes only first law of thermodynamics. In other words, this equation is missing knowledge. This equation is missing information regarding the second law of thermodynamics. And this is why in Kevin's problem, you could not solve for the, the first part of the problem, which in the first part of the homework, when I first released the homework, I wanted you to do it on your own, but you couldn't do it without involving entropy. You cannot, and it was a funny relation because and, uh, we, we, it's also there in the homework fourth. Now you will do it actually using the entropy. Last time we could not do it because u as a function of t comma v is correct, but it is in missing information. And this leads us to the concept of natural variables. The natural variables for u are s and v. I'm going to ask you this in a pop quiz or in a midterm or something. I will ask you this for all other variables also. It becomes hard in, a, in, in class exam when you don't have any notes or anything. Right now it's easy, you will have it written somewhere, but I would like it to go inside your heads and stay there and not just in your notes. And how do we say that the natural variables for u are s comma v? That we can say because of the integrated first and second law of thermodynamics. When you see the integrated first and second law of thermodynamics, the natural the derivatives are s and v. This is extremely important when you apply thermodynamics to a practical problem. We are now going to see in a moment what are the natural variables for Helmholtz energy, for Gibbs energy. And if you know what are the natural variables, the problem is basically solved. It's quite simple. If you don't know the natural variables, there are a lot of scientific papers which are wrong because people are not careful with their natural variables. Is this clear to everyone? What do I mean over here? It's a slightly higher level of abstraction, but it's not too bad. Okay, so remember once again, u of s comma v is correct, u of t comma v is also correct, but u of t comma v includes information only about the first law of thermodynamics. u of t comma v is missing information about second law, and that's why T, V are not the natural variables for you. S comma V are natural variables for you, okay? So now that we have established that S comma V are natural variables for you, and uh, also I wanna highlight here that we are talking about constant composition systems. We are not allowing composition to change. So our N is constant. So if we allowed composition to change, the natural variables for you would be S, V, N if variable compositions. And I hope some of you take M684 less next sem uh, in, in fall in, uh, in your senior years or whatever. There you will see how this follows really from entropy having U, V, N as its natural variables. That's a restatement of the second law of thermodynamics. That's where it all comes from. Another way of looking at you. I did not miss any details here. I, I, I did not just say, take it because I say it. I'm, I'm proving it for you how this happened. You can see why this happened over here. So, but we are not going to worry about n right now. We will get to n in a little bit. Now that we have u is equal to u of s comma v, we can write down du is equal to partial u by partial s at v ds 
actually, before I write that, I want to write something else from this page. Remember, in this page, we wrote du is equal to TDS minus PDD, right? This equation should be a new best friend. I would like you to just like remove everything from front of you, just an empty piece of paper and be able to write down this equation from scratch. Please, please do that. If you do that, you are gonna be in such good shape for the final exam, and for real. If this equation should be your BFF, you make a heart and stars and whatever, it's super important. <clears throat> But given that u is equal to u of s comma v, we can also write something else. We can write du is equal to partial u by partial s at constant v multiplied by ds plus partial u by partial v at constant s multiplied by dv. So what equation number where we are? We went to four. Okay, good. Let's call this as equation number five. Then this is advanced material, so I marked it later. And let's call this as equation number six. Compare five with six. Both of them are talking about du in two different ways. And the only way both of these equations can be true at all given times is if t, if the coefficients of ds are true in both of them. So if you write both of them together, you get TDS minus PDV is equal to partial U by partial S V DS plus partial U by partial V S DV. And this is to be true for all DS, all DV, all S, all V, yada, yada. The only way that is going to be true if T is equal to partial U by partial S at V and if minus p is equal to partial u by partial v at constant s, which brings us to two very interesting relations that temperature is equal to partial u by partial s at constant v, and pressure is equal to minus partial u by partial v at constant s. This over here is the most fundamental definition of temperature. So far we were We use temperature as a measure of kinetic energy, right? But in thermodynamics, this is actually the most fundamental definition of, you, you don't have to consider it as a definition, but if you really start thermodynamics in a more rigorous way, as is done in 684, you will realize that this is the most fundamental definition. How does the internal energy change with entropy with respect to volume? And you can show, if you want, that it is equivalent to our common sense definitions of temperature. So, I mean, if it, if it gets, this week is warmer than last week, you don't go and tell your mom, oh, looks like the partial derivative of internal energy with respect to entropy at constant volume is rising. So you'll be like, what, you're going crazy or something? You can't do that, but it is the most accurate, unless your mom or dad are experts on thermodynamics, then, then you could very well do that. So, uh, but, so how did we get these relations? We got these by simply comparing these two things. That's, that's why I said today's lecture is like the peak, peak of the math that we are going to do. Another thing we can do with using this du is equal to TDS minus PDV is the famous or infamous, depending on how you feel about it, Maxwell relations. Maxwell relations, you saw them in the first homework, so you have at least a small amount of familiarity with them. And you would recall from there that the whole idea was to think about functions of two variables or three variables, x comma y, and to say that if df is equal to g dx plus h dy, then partial g by partial y at constant x. So this one differentiated with y at constant x is equal to partial h by partial x at constant y, right? This, this had some sort of name which I have forgotten. Anyone remembers what was the name for this condition? We had the name in the module, someone typed. Eulers, yes, exactly. Eulers and there was something else also, some other name. 
some funky name, but yeah, it's Euler's condition, you know, for a total derivative to be true. And this is what we are going to use for Maxwell relations. So we have du is equal to TDS minus PDV. So here, G is the same as T and H is the same as minus P, right? So therefore partial T by partial V at constant S is equal to minus partial P by partial S at constant V. This is our first Maxwell relation. And you can see why I keep saying that this du is equal to TDS minus PDV should be your best buddy. Yeah, it's a condition for it being an exact differential that the order of the derivative should not matter. So here, what we are saying really is that partial square F by partial X, Y partial is equal to partial square F by partial Y, X, which order, the order in which you differentiate does not matter. And now with your superior knowledge of path differentials, you can see this is really saying that something is a state function. It does not matter whether you change y first and then x or whether you change x first and then y. Yeah, Clairaut's theorem, that's the one I was looking for. I, it doesn't matter if even if you don't remember the name, it's this condition that matters, okay? So we had du is equal to TDS minus PDV. So if they take T, differentiate it, we take T, differentiate it with respect to volume at constant S, and we take minus p and differentiate it with respect to entropy at constant volume. That's our first Maxwell relation. We can do more Maxwell relations. How do they happen? They happen from the other state functions. So every state function, I shouldn't really stay, say every, because it doesn't really happen for entropy. Entropy is kind of, yeah. The state functions, we just showed it for u, right? So the other three state functions that we have looked at, which is enthalpy, Helmholtz free energy, and Gibbs free energy, lead to three more Maxwell relations. And I am doing this right now here. This is exactly what you need to do in the homework. You can just go and copy from this notes, but please don't do that. Please try to do it on your own. That's the point. I won't know whether you did it on your own or whether you copied it from the notes. You will get full points either way. But if you really want to increase your chances of doing well in the final exam, I would recommend to go through the notes and shut it and try to derive all four, starting only from this one, the integrated first and second law of thermodynamics and the definition of the state functions. You should be able to derive all Maxwell relations on your own. And in fact, do it again, do it a couple of times. Yes, all three state functions are exact differentials because well, differential of a state function is an exact function. Differential of a path function. So I will write it down, good point Elizabeth. So differentials of state functions are exact differentials. Differentials of path functions are not, in ex are not exact differentials. So you cannot do this with dq or dw, you have to do it with da, dg and all. So let's, let's, let's do this. So number two here is our g, let's look at g first. So g is equal to h minus ts, therefore dg is equal to dh, If I was totally honest with you, I should also do it without looking at my notes, but it will take me a bit more than 10 minutes that we have in class, so pardon me. Now we can use the definition for H, which is U plus PV minus TDS minus STT is equal to DU plus PDV plus VDP minus TDS minus SDT. If I'm writing too fast for you, don't try to just to copy at the same speed, just, just look at it and do it again, you'll be fine. Now DU is, we use the integrated second law, DU is equal to TDS minus PDV. And again, we are thinking only about uh, expansion work, plus PDV plus VDP, minus TDS, minus SDT, a bunch of things cancel out. 
minus PDV plus PDV cancels out, TDS minus TDS cancels out, we are left with VDP minus SDT or DG is equal to VDP minus SDT. So what are the natural variables for G? Can anyone help me? Uh, buzzer, P and T. Be careful, Jared. P and T. And that makes sense. We just showed that the condition for spontaneous change at constant pressure and temperature involves G. So it's no new information. You could have said that even without doing this. Now we can do our Maxwell relation straightforward. Take the partial of V with respect to temperature at constant P. That should be the same as partial of minus S or minus of partial of S with partial P at constant temperature. This is Maxwell relation number two. I'm calling it number one and number two, not because I like one more than another. You could switch the numbering, but the point being there are four of them. Let's now move to A with the Helmholtz free energy, which is dA is going to be D of U minus TDS, D of U minus TS is equal to DU minus TDS minus SDT is equal to TDS minus PDV minus TDS minus SDT is equal to minus PDV minus SDT. So the natural variables for A are V and T. And our Maxwell relation comes from looking, both are minus, so there will be no minus sign, sign this time. There will be partial P by partial T at constant volume is equal to partial S by partial V at constant temperature. This is Maxwell relation number three. And the final one, comes from looking at H, the enthalpy. DH is equal to D of U plus PV. And uh, you can see it's, we can even do it without my notes. This is equal to DU plus PDV plus VDP. DU is equal to TDS minus PDV plus PDV plus VDP. So DU became this thing over here. It minus PDV plus PDV cancels. This is equal to TDS plus VDP. So natural variables, natural variables for H are S and P. So these, this is an interesting one. So for Gibbs energy and Helmholtz energy, the natural variables were what you kind of thought, pressure, temperature, and volume temperature. But for internal energy and enthalpy, the temperature goes away and you're left with entropy. So anytime you have H as expressed as a function of S and P, you have more information than H as a function of T and P. Something is missing, but it's not true for G. G as a function of P and T has all the information. And this is exactly why Kevin's problem, first part we were not able to do in our pre-entropy work. And, uh, Okay, any question? So in the, in the homework, fourth homework, you will be doing exactly this derivation that I did here. And again, I cannot request enough. Please try to do it on your own. Close your notes and everything. Just try to get it done once. It will help you a lot. I'm going to write down the last Maxwell. Oh yeah, thank you. Sorry, I forgot about that. Let's do it. Partial T by partial P at constant S is equal to partial V by partial S at constant P. Okay, so this is our MR number four. So in a, in a pre-coronavirus world, 
anytime we would teach this, we would teach you complicated tricks to remember the Maxwell relation. We would draw a square and there'd be random lines going through there. And even, I, I even have a mnemonic for you to remember it. Let's see what it was. It went something like, good P chemists have studied under very awesome teachers. If you remember that, you could draw a square where magic square where things look like V, A, T, U, G, S, H, P, and you have to start. Good P chemists have blah, blah, blah. The reason I'm not writing all this because what one thing coronavirus has showed us, if you can find it on the internet, then why even remember? That's how I think about it. If you can find it on the internet within five seconds, then why even remember? You can find the Maxwell relations on the internet in five seconds. And I'm not going to give you an exam where I have like a secret camera looking on you. I think that's a terrible thing to do. I hate it. It's, 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 it's so disrespectful to all of us. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna do that ever. So all, I, all my exams will be take home. And if they're take home open internet, you can find Maxwell relations on the internet. But when you just look at a relation like this one, where you have a bunch of partial derivatives, that looks messy, right? Like, why, where did this come from? It's really simple though, especially the first one, the internal energy one. This one directly follows from the integrated first law and second law of thermodynamics. So I want you to become comfortable with them. I don't want you to remember the final form, but I want you to do like a speed thing and derive all four of them in two minutes, one minute. Can you do it? If you can do it, then you really have an idea of what's going on. For those of you who have seen rock climbing videos, you know where people are climbing without a rope and just jumping from hole to hole. And once in a while they die, but if they don't die, they become internet celebrities. You can become a celebrity with deriving Maxwell relation in uh, as little time as you can. Okay, so, so what have we done? A bit of a recap, we had our U, we had our H is equal to U plus PV. We have our A is equal to U minus TS. And we had our Gibbs free energy equal to H minus TS. These are the four state functions. And of course, S and T and P and V are also state functions. I had you up until the last part. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, and uh, we showed that du is equal to TDS minus PDV is the most fundamental equation which includes first and second law. Once you have this, you just have to plug in it into this. So this directly gives you Maxwell relation number one, right? By looking at this one derivative of this. To get the other Maxwell relations, take this and plug it in here. And from this, you can calculate all four Maxwell relations just with this information. You don't need any other information whatsoever. So let's look at the practical use of Maxwell relation. Again, I'm helping you with one of the homework problems. Let's use it to calculate the internal pressure of a perfect gas and of a Van der gas. So what is the internal pressure? Internal pressure is partial U by partial V at constant temperature, right? So we have du is equal to TDS minus PDV for any gas, and this should be a BFF equation. Therefore, du, still total derivatives by dV is equal to TDS by dV minus P, right? Now enforce constant temperature. At constant temperature, this will mean that partial U by partial V at constant temperature is equal to T because it's constant, but partial S by partial V at constant temperature minus P, right? This is, this is the first problem on the homework, so I'll just help you with it, but hopefully it should be obvious to you when you're doing the homework. So, or, now we can use a Maxwell relation because we just showed that partial, we, we have partial S by partial V at constant T. And what can we do? We, we know that partial S by partial V at constant T is equal to partial P by partial T at constant T. So this thing is equal to T partial B by partial T at constant V minus P. Oh, by the way, 
I want to mention one more thing that these type of equations have their own names. They are called thermodynamic equation of state. So you have seen equation of states in the past, right? Where you have PV is equal to NRT or Van der Waals equation of state. These ones are called thermodynamic equation of state because they include both first law and second law. They are complete. So with this thermodynamic equation of state, we can now go to perfect gas. So, and why did we do this? Because partial U by partial V at cost partial T is pi T, right? So therefore pi T is equal to this. So for perfect gas, P is equal to NRT by V. Therefore partial P by partial T at constant V is equal to NR by V. Therefore T partial P by partial T at constant V is equal to NRT by V is equal to P. Therefore T partial P by partial T at constant V minus P is equal to zero. So this term is zero for an ideal gas. Therefore internal pressure for an ideal gas is equal to zero. We can go to a Van der Waals gas where P is equal to NRT by V minus NB and I'm done. I know I'm going over time. And here we can show that partial P by partial T at constant V is this term won't matter, right? There is no temperature dependence over here. So this is going to be NR by V minus NB. Therefore, pi T is equal to this term multiplied by temperature is equal to NRT by V minus NB minus P. And if you see, that is exactly A n square by V square. So the internal pressure for a Van der Waals gas is that second term internal pressure comes from attractive forces. That's what you're seeing over here. Okay, so this was a lot of material. This was kind of like the maximum mathematical peak in this semester. So if you have survived till here, if you're still showing up at 9 a.m., all 52 of you, good job. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate your presence. It will be annoying to speak to a vacuum. And uh, the you are now ready to do the homework number four. Connor will be having his office hours next week, but this homework should not be hard to you if you understand today's lecture. Uh, the last problem is a different type of problem. You have to look up physical constants and things like that, but, but you can do it. Next class we will take from here we will talk about some concepts which are mathematically not complicated, but they lead to a lot of heartburn called fugacity. Math get tougher for 482. Depends on you that, and you will have more matrices in uh, chem 482. Do you like matrices? You like matrix multiplication? If you do, then it's easy. If you don't, <laughs> you'll have fun. 482 will have matrices. 482 will have eigenvalues. It won't have Okay, it does get harder, sorry, <laughs> but not in this one. This one now there will be more complicated concepts. We will be talking about fugacity, we will be talking about chemical potential, we will be talking about phase diagrams. So for those of you who are from material science are gonna have a bit easy in a little bit. So the equation of state are these two ones. I'll just write it down as partial u by partial v at t is equal to this. These two are called thermodynamic equations of state because they include both first and second law. That's just a name. Okay, so see you all on Friday. You can ask more questions on Slack. <laughs>